um, what this particular presentation is all about. Um, yeah, so I will open it up for question and answers. Is there a guideline on what data you can uh, collect or what, what you cannot, like you can collect like the location data from browser, uh -huh. but are you able to tap into like, Google or Amazon login data? Yeah. So, so basically, um, as long as we pay attention to these three things, we are upfront with the user that this is the data we are collecting, and this is the data we are using for making uh, these decisions. As long as we are open with the user about it, uh, we can collect the data. Uh, again, coming back to Amazon logins and Facebook, etc., uh, the user has a choice of what they want to share with the application. So um, the Facebook login, even if we can access their account, if the user has set their preferences that only this information we share, we cannot really access anything other than that. Um, so it depends on users sharing uh, what they want to share, and the system can access that information. Do users have to log in to save their uh, wish list item? Uh, no, so users don't have to um, log in. Uh, we do provide support using cookies so that as the user uh, navigates through the incentives and saves the incentive to their wish list, as long as they're using the same device, they can come back again and access the wish list. So again, that was one of the challenge in our early user research. That was one of the challenge that was raised, where uh, the business owners really didn't want to register with the website and provide their information just to uh, navigate and access the incentives. So, yeah. Are there examples of state targets or agencies that are using this type of um, so we also worked on uh, CA.gov state uh, portal, and CA.gov also uses uh, this kind of uh, information. Initially, um, uh, it, it is a simplistic uh, use case where we are using the location data, the time, the season to provide relevant imagery so that we can you know, connect with the customer um, at that level. Uh, but the next phase is to present relevant services to the customer. So that really relates to my question. So Jan had mentioned the outreach to county, city, special districts. What is the plan for the outreach to the end users, the businesses? And then um, just interested in what was the time frame start to finish? Yeah. Well, the, the outreach to the customers is a coordinated effort between the treasurer's office and CSAC, um, no, excuse me, uh, the California Business Roundtable and the National Federation of Independent Businesses. So there are a, a number of forums where their constituents come together and we are traveling the state, um, very small extent, but um, going out to where they're gathering and telling them about it so that their businesses are aware of it and they can come to it. And, um, part of our mar marketing outreach effort will also include um, creating that online profile so when somebody's looking for a California incentive, CBIG comes to the top of the list or along that line. And then time frames? Yes, how long did it take? We started this project, um, well, I, I did the hiring for it in the fall of 2015. And um, we, be we began to strategize. We spent maybe five months doing the design and strategy of what we wanted. And then we laid out the implementation and the treasurer said, I want the deployment accelerated from what we could do in-house. And so then we put out a, an RFO and uh, sought <coughs> solicitation responses and hired SimSoft to accelerate our deployment. And we deployed in December, so it was about 14 months from start to finish, from design to deployment. Right. 
Yeah, and actually we came on board somewhere around um, April time. of 2016. Right, yeah. um, March. Did, March. March. So, so I we got budget authority to fill um, the positions to do this effective July 1, 2015. The hiring was completed in the fall. We got the uh, solicitation out. Um, after we had come up with our strategy, they were hired in the spring of 2016, and December 2016, we deployed. So I have a couple questions. First, um, is there any limitations with the type of device or operating system um, in integrating with the location feature? And then the second part is, are, are you able to integrate with information that we know about the person? So I'm with the Franchise Tax Board, right. so if I know who you are, then I know. Right. Uh, well, actually, I probably know where you are, but um, I also know whether you owe or you just got a bill and right. things like that. Right, yeah. Um, so again, uh, going back to, um, so the location information, the limitation as such is if the browser so there are two ways we do it. The browser detection is a common uh, scenario in case of public sector implementations. For private sector implementation, we do go from IP address to geolocation. So even if the browser detection <coughs> is turned off, we still rely on the IP to geolocation uh, to identify the location information for the user. Um, in terms of the using the customer data, that is where the explicit and implicit uh, data comes in picture. Implicit is when they don't log in and we rely completely on their navigation history. The explicit data is when you do have information about the users. And uh, again, in private sector implementations that we have uh, done, that is used a lot. So for example, we're working with a company uh, who provides subscription-based um, content, so it's like it's a content marketing company who do pro who provides information about uh, drugs information and so on. Uh, so they do a lot of research and collect and generate content, and then they sell that content. So the subscription of the user, what is the level of subscription? What did they access in past? So all of that is internal business related data about the customer. So we use that along with their implicit data um, and combine that in order to customize their experience. But we're not, let me, let, just yeah. quick response on that. We're not collecting any tax ID information. And if they apply to any of these incentive programs, that data is not held by STO or the CBIG application. That application is directly with the government entity that's offering that incentive. So um, we are providing, again, the marketplace, but we're not collecting tax ID profile information. Right. Okay. I, I, I think follow-up was, uh, where is that information hosted then? So, so that information can be used dynamically. So your business application, say in case of a TD, uh, you could have the customer data in your internal business systems, and we can use that via API and combine it with the, uh, the implicit data is the analytics data. So as the user navigates, clicks on things, it goes into um, kind of uh, any external data source. I mean, it can be uh, hosted on cloud or it can be hosted uh, on-premise. And we combine those two. So uh, there are various scenarios that can be done, but based on your privacy and security requirements, it can be just in time access or it can be uh, replication of data. And so it can be hosted 100% within yeah. our, our yeah. system. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, it Thank can you. be. Sorry, a lot of questions back here. Yeah, no really problem. Interested. <laughs> Um, do you have any plans or are you in commu communication with any other um, state organizations? Like I know that the um, Office of Economic Development is part of, has started a California business portal where they're trying to have kind of one-stop shop for, um, you know, folks wanting to start a new business and, you know, tying in incentives seems like a natural kind of fit. We have been. We've been working together. Um, 
with GoBiz and several of the others, making sure that what we're offering is not an overlap or stepping on that territory, but how do we also have their incentives? So for example, um, Selby Stanislaw, the Franchise Tax Board, said yes, put their incentives on our website. And so they were one of the first state agencies. So it's not a concern if, if there's a duplication of incentives out there that they appear in more than one place. Like you may shop for a product on Amazon or shop someplace else. Yeah. We don't do that. No, we, no but, but for the business portal, they're trying to advertise that. If that's where people go to get all that sort of information, and so it seems like a natural fit to like, link or somehow advertise yeah. what you're doing. Right, that's and we will share business. links. Oh, okay. And, and GoBiz has a lot of that, too, if you're um, you know, trying to figure out how to file for your license at Secretary of State and that okay. sort of thing. So GoBiz will have links to us, we will to them, and to the, uh, there's a few other handful of other state entities that have similar things that we do want to build that linkage. Yeah, and you're right. The GoBiz provides the process-related information to business, while uh, CBIG is focused on the incentives-related uh, information. So from GoBiz, link to CBIG, and if someone uh, comes to CBIG, there is information on CBIG, telling them what CB provides. So for anything else, um, you know, they can go back to go this. Um, yeah. I'm from Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Um, one of the things that I was thinking of um, is providing personalized information to a parole agent. Mm -hmm. um, so if they're going to a particular location to meet with one of the parolees, um, you know, can we, is there a way that we could look at um, what are all the, who are all they, um, yeah. who are the people that they interact with right. um, and potential parolees around that area and things like that. So we have data, but, yeah. you know, putting it together in the context of a, of a parole agent or a parolee. That's right. Um, yeah. So is that... Yeah, that's, that's a whole new so RFO. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> whole yeah, different that's system. True. That's true. And do you do mobile? Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Because, yeah. because and what you are saying, um, you know, when the agent is on the field, you know, uh, the mobile makes perfect sense, right? Yes. So uh, everything that we are doing here, we do provide services both on web and mobile, um, as well as when you're you're you kind of working on the website, they are also responsive. Um, so in the scenario that you're describing, based on what all information they are collecting and how much um, ease of use makes a difference in terms of, um, let's say that um, whether we create a native uh, mobile application or whether we use responsive design and you know we use what is created for web, those would be the decisions that um, that depend a lot on how users are going to use the system. Right. Uh, yeah, but what you're saying is uh, perfectly possible, and we, we have done that, in fact, for one of our customers. Um, we, we actually worked on a Uber-like app uh, for one of the customers that uh, the customers could request a service, and the providers who are on the field uh, could access it, like they could request the provider. Hi, uh, thanks. Sabita Jan, this is really, really great stuff. Um, uh, it was great to hear that there are sort of targets to onboard providers to, to using the platform. And um, we have some experience with uh, some of the challenges to get people uh, onboarded to use a new digital platform. And uh, oftentimes what they want to know are, you know, how many people are visiting the website and, and basic kind of web traffic mm -hmm. metrics. But with the contextually aware uh, site and, and app behind the scenes that you guys have built, are there new whiz-bang type metrics that might feed into that marketing plan that would get yes. people on board? Yeah, yeah, and I basically that is the direction, uh, the platform that we have implemented allows us to collect the data, but not only the analytics data, but not only collect it, but use it dynamically to do A-B testing, multivariate testing, 
and that is how we um, kind of uh, reach out to the government partners and tell them that okay there are people coming here and here is how many um, have actually looked at your incentives so in fact um, if you go look at the website for each incentive we also provide the number of views um, without having to log in and so on. So you, you can just at a glance take a look at, okay, people are looking at it. And because it is location aware, uh, that promotes naturally the local incentive. So everyone wants to be on the platform because people are coming there, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. There's a question in the back. <laughs> um, just out of curiosity, have you done any work for DOJ? Um, not yet. Okay. Because <laughs> I, I currently work there. And I'm thinking of a project where this would use this technology. Yeah, so, yeah, so um, you have the contact information. I'll give you my business card, too. <laughs> I'll take your business card. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, I heard that I mentioned that Mm -hmm. So how is it governed? So they have to uh, register on our site, and then they submit what their incentives are. And we don't police the incentives for qualifying or not. We just make sure it's actual, the content is actual incentives, you know, and that and it's legitimate language and that they have an actual website and that sort of thing. And then it just flows right on through. They have their own account and they update and change the incentives when, because most of these incentives, ha incentives have a lifespan and they expire at a certain time so they need to be removed and refreshed and all of that. So that is the responsibility of our government partners to handle their own content. Okay. So you don't need like approval process? Yeah, that is. It just on the on the actual yeah. content to make sure that those incentives that they're submitting are legit. You know, I mean, as far as legitimate language, professional, that sort of thing, right. um, we don't we don't validate the incentive itself. Yeah. Okay. So, so the workflow exists. That is, uh, what we validate for or approve for is the language and uh, making sure that it is valid incentive rather than. Okay, do you really have money or not? That kind of so not the business okay. level decisions, but more editorial guidelines. Okay, but we can always um, yeah create a workflow behind. The yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you. It.